word with God. Shall we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we're very grateful at this hour that we can give our attention to the things in your word. And Lord, we do pray your assistance, your visitation in this place, that you would come down, that the mountains might flow down at your presence. And Lord, I pray that you do a spiritual work at, at this hour in each life and accomplish purposes beyond our ability even to ask or to think and do exceeding abundantly above all of that. We pray, Lord, that people's hearts might be turned to you, that we would be stirred in love and worship, and those who perhaps are still outside the family of God would come to see their need for him and draw nigh to Jesus today, who is the door into the fold of God forever. Thank you, Lord, for this hour. Thank you for the word of God. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I think all my buttons are pushed the right way. All right. You know, moving is always a big deal. I'm talking about making a move physically from one place to another. Always takes a little bit more than we expect. It takes a great deal of planning. Normally, unless we fly by the seat of the pants, we've, we, we're planning out our move weeks in advance, if not months in advance. And then you've got all the time it takes to pack up everything that you think is important. And then you've got the sweat equity that you put in as you're packing the truck that day. And maybe you have some friends and church families come over and they help pack the things in. I want you just to imagine a little bit with me that you're making a major move. I, I, I would imagine that all of us in this room at some time or another have had to pick up where we were and go to another location. I want you to think through that with me and just imagine that a scenario in your mind. Imagine having to pick through your keepsakes and deciding which things are worth packing up and going and which things need to be discarded or carted down to a Goodwill or a thrift store or, or perhaps just taken to the dump. And uh, you, you're, you're pulling through all of those materials and you're making decisions and you're, you're putting you know, your pile of discards in one place in the garage and your pile of stuff that needs to go and packed and labeled and and, and as I said, you get your family, you get friends together, and you pack the truck, and all that, that, that morning of the move, you know, you got the big, awkward pieces of furniture, the bureau that you don't want to move, and that needs to be moved, and the couch, you know, the sectional that's got to be taken apart, and all the bed frames, you pack that in, you get all the boxes in there, and you're, you're getting toward the end of the truck, it's later in the day, and you got all these odds and ends, these odd fans and vacuum cleaners and two-wheel bicycles that you have to somehow fit in around, you know, push it in and push on the doors. And you get to the end of the truck and you're like, okay, I think we got it. I think we're ready to go. And you look around and you can't find somebody. Can't find your spouse. So you're like, well, you know, as she's saying goodbye to the neighbor, you look across the street, you can't see her, and kind of look back, you go back into the empty house at this time, and you're moving room to room. Maybe she's just saying a final goodbye to some spot, and she's not there. Finally, you find her, she's on the back patio. She's sitting on the concrete, and she's weeping. And she says to you, I'm not going. <laughs> My heart's not in it. You're on your own. Now, if you don't have a spouse, I want you to imagine another family member or your favorite pet deciding we're not, we're not on board with this. Now, that might sound like a ridiculous scenario. I hope that it never happens to you, but it does set the backdrop or the scene for us today because as we open up Exodus chapter 33 and we begin to comb through the opening verses, this precise scenario unfolds for the children of Israel. Would you look with me at that? Exodus chapter 33 and verse number 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee. And I'll drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey, 
for I will not go up in the midst of thee. Did you catch that? For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Israel's been at Sinai for nearly a year, about 11 months, receiving instructions from the Lord, first audibly from the top of the mountain, and then Israel said, no, Moses, you go to the top of the mountain, get the stuff, bring it back, we'll do it, just don't make that voice talk to us anymore. We'll take your word for it. And so Moses has been up, remember, he's been up there for 40 days and 40 nights. He's come back down and Israel's that quickly in a period of weeks has turned into idolatry with the golden calf. and they, They've gone into deviant worship right there before the mount of the Lord while they still see the cloud in the mountain. As for Moses, we don't know what's become of him. Make us gods, Aaron, that shall go before us. And now God is saying, you know what, Moses? You can go, it's time to go, but I'm not going to go with this group. I'll send my angel, I'm not going with you. You know, for many, that wouldn't be that big a deal, especially in America. An angel, we could really market that. We can go places with that. Angels, that works. And you go into a Christian bookstore, all right? Go online, type in Christian, Christian effects, angels. I mean, we we can make that work. We can pump money into that. We can make that fly. Pardon the pun. All right, we can go somewhere with the angel thing, right? But not so fast with Moses. He says, no, no, I'm not comfortable with that. I need something more. I'm not going forward without you. You two are on a journey. Not the same one as Moses and the children of Israel, but you're on a journey. Are you just going to go it alone? Are you just going to look for an angel to touch your wings or touch your arm through life? Are you going to insist that when you go, you go with God? Or that God goes with you? Now hear me out. I'm not talking about salvation. I I, I imagine that the majority of the people before me today profess faith in Jesus Christ, that He is your Savior. You've asked Him to be your Savior. You've asked Him to forgive your sins. And He has washed you white as snow and has given you a place in the family of God that lasts for all of time and all of eternity. I'm taking that for granted today. That may not be true for you, but I'm taking that for granted. So I'm not talking about salvation. I'm assuming that you know Him. But I'm not assuming in in this room necessarily that because you're a Christian, you're actually moving with God. You may be moving, but the question is, are you moving forward with God? That's what's on the table today. Can you move or should you move forward without God? Let me give you two marks that mark a person who is moving forward with God. These are right out of Moses' life. Two marks of people who are actually attempting to move forward with God. Now, this isn't as easy as it sounds like, right? Moving forward with God. You've been a Christian for a while. Moving forward with God can get a little confusing. It can get a little cloudy. You can go through the valley of the shadow of death sometimes. How do you make out your way? How can I be sure I'm moving forward with God and not just on my own? Is this this just this thought about moving on or doing this or taking that job? Is that just in my mind? Or is it what God wants me to do? How can I know? Two marks of a person who's moving forward with God, number one. This person is getting alone with God. Number one, this person who wants to move forward with God is making time to get alone with God. We see this right in the text. Look with me. This is Moses now we're talking about. Verse number 7, Moses took the tabernacle. Exodus 33, verse 7, so we're all together. Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp. Lost my place. There we are. And and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Well, if you're mature in the faith, you understand by now, right, that if I'm going to grow, if I'm going to go with God, I need to know Him. So how do you invite God to be part of your life? We actually have to make a point of getting alone with Him, and we see this right in the text with Moses. He took a tabernacle, pitched it without the camp. Tabernacle is the Old Testament word for tent. And he pitched it without the camp, the Bible says, afar off from the camp. That tells us an important piece of information you need to know. This isn't the worship tabernacle. Remember, that, that actually hasn't been built yet. The instructions have been given in Exodus already. 
but it actually hasn't been built yet. It hasn't been dedicated. And when it is, it's going to be in the middle of the camp, and there's going to be three tribes on the east, three tribes on the south, three tribes in the west, and three tribes to the north, and the tabernacle will be in the middle, but this isn't the ta- that isn't this tabernacle. This is just called the tent of the congregation. This is just the tent of meeting. This is just Moses' place to get alone with God. Now you think about this. If you're managing and operating a community that's two million strong, all right, two million strong is what we estimate the Israelites to be. And if that's too big a number, take 600,000. But 2 million works pretty easily because Tucson is about a million people in the metro area. We're talking about two times the size of Tucson marching through the wilderness. That's a lot of people. I bet it got a little bit noisy in town. What do you think? Just people moving around, people bartering, trading, fixing things, you know, uh, cobbling shoes or... Or, or just fixing the food and gathering the wood and setting a pot ablaze to make the evening meal. There's noise in the camp. We already know from Exodus chapter 18 that Moses was distracted because people were bringing his ca- their cases to him one by one, and he had this massive caseload. You decide between me and this guy. This guy says this, and I say that. What is it, Moses? So what does Moses do? He pitches a tent outside the camp away from all the people. He gets alone. And what's the purpose of the tent? He pitches the tent to meet with God. We see this in the next verses, verses 8 and 9. It came to pass when Moses went out to the tabernacle, that is his tent, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone to the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. So Moses got outside the camp to meet with God. He got away from the hustle and the bustle. This actually tells us, first bullet here today is the place. He had a place where he could get alone with God. You too need a place if you're going to get alone with God. You're, You're going to have to get away from your noisy life and the noise of those around you. Do you realize it's harder than ever to get a quiet place today? Everywhere you go, there's noise. I go into a restaurant to meet with people and have a conversation, which I've done in the last couple of weeks with people in this room. And I've had to ask the the restaurant lady, could you turn that TV off because we'd like to talk. (laughs) Just noise everywhere. Constant pressure of the schedule on top of that, the pace of life tends to push us away from the very thing we need, a quiet stillness with God. You know, I get it because I've been there. You know, I'm not, I am a father of five, but it was even before I was a father of five, I was a, I was a son in a family of seven, and it was hard to find any place in the house where somebody else wasn't. When I was a teenager, I would go out to my car sitting on the road in front of my house, and I'd get in there and close the door. I'd kick this, recline the seat back, and kind of just shut the world out so I could talk to God. Sometimes I've done that by taking a walk, just go out away by myself and look at the scenery and talk to God. Maybe you prefer your prayer, a prayer closet in your home, a, a place that you designate where you sit, or a, spot, a chair that you have, or a room that you go to, and that's your God place. That's where you meet. But, but you have a place, right? So critical to have a place so you can get alone and meet with God. Moses was going to move forward with God, and a part of that was he had this regular habit of going to a place to meet with God. You know, you could assess right now whether you're moving forward with God. Is he part of your life? Do you get alone with him? Do you have a place where you talk with him? Paul, I think Paul's next up on the screen, or Phil. It's not Paul, it's Phil. Phil's a busy man, father of two children. He's a manager, account manager for a landscaping company. He works a great deal of hours, often gone early in the morning by 7.15. Doesn't normally get home until after 6.30 in the night. Some of you have schedules like that. Hard, always moving in the afternoon as part of his, uh, his business. He's going around and checking accounts and meeting with clients. 
And he's often miles from home as he's driving around in his landscaping truck. So for him, his sanctuary becomes wherever he is from one, po- from one meeting to the next. He finds a clump of trees or a park and he pulls over. And in his truck, that becomes his sanctuary. And he packs his lunch. And while he's eating lunch, he's conversing with God quietly by himself in his busy schedule. That's what works for him. I don't know exactly what will work for you, but I think you ought to have a place. It might be the cab of a truck. It might be in a park on a bench. It might be in your room, in your home, if if you're fortunate enough to have a quiet home to do that in. But you need a place. And Moses had a place where he met with God outside of the camp. Sometimes finding that place is going to take a little bit of creativity on your part. But he went out to that place on purpose so that he could meet, verse number 9, with God. And when he entered the tabernacle, it says, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. We've already encountered the cloudy pillar, right? That's the visible sign of God's presence with the children of Israel in the wilderness. This cloudy pillar that provided protection from the sun during the day and a, a, a pillar of fire to keep them warm by night as they marched through the desert. And this pillar came out. Do we have a picture of that coming up? The presence of the Lord, tent of meeting. The pillar comes and stands in front of the tent door. And there Moses is actually alone meeting with God. And so part of that place is making sure that you enter into the presence of the Lord. God came visibly in that pillar of the cloud. And He spoke audibly to Moses. Look at verse 11. The Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend and he turned again into the camp face to face friendship it was close it was personal it was intimate and it suggests because they were friends they were both enjoying it right if you're having a conversation with your friend you're normally both parties are enjoying it or one party is going to excuse themselves you know i'm kind of bushed i think i ought to go home now you know, I haven't, I haven't started my taxes for 2022 yet. I better get home. But no, if you're friends, I mean, you're right on. You're, you're right on it. You're, you're both enjoying it. And it suggests that the two of them are enjoying each other's presence. Again, life is busy. It's full of activities. But Christian people down through the ages have seen the necessity of having a quiet place and a quiet time with God. Why? It's really impossible to move forward with God if you're not walking with God. If He and you aren't talking constantly, it's hard to pick up the direction you're supposed to be going. We have technological gadgetry that makes it today easier than ever. Some of you are actually following the message today with an electronic device in your hand and you're looking up the verses, all right? Some of you like paper and pen and, you know, a hard book, but I mean... It's more and more common. Did, we can stay more connected. We can listen to podcasts. We can listen to Christian music right from our phones. We are really connected. We, and we get push notifications even in the middle of the night. Updates to our social media feed. Who's liked our post? But as a result of that, you know, though we could be more connected to God, we often aren't as connected to Him as we are. We, we're probably connected to other people. But I don't know that we're any more connected to God today because we're not quiet and we're not alone. You know, Moses wanted to go forward with God and the key to that was he was already in the habit of getting alone with God. Alexa, you have Alexa at home? Don't raise your hand. She's updating us on the news or the the baseball scores from the day. Even work knows how to get a hold of us now because, you know, if they've forgotten or misplaced some information because we've, got, we've given them our cell phone and they chase us down at home. It's really hard to get quiet with God. But not Moses. He went outside the camp. He got away and he got with his friend. He went out of the place. Out, rather, he went out to the place and he fell into the presence of the Lord. He went out to the place, and he fell into the presence of the Lord. You need to go out to your place, and you need to fall into the presence of the Lord so that you know you're going forward with Him and not on your own. And there you'll find strength, encouragement, direction, and all that you need to live this life. I heard recently about Jeff and Cheryl Scruggs. Maybe you've heard about their book, I Do Again. 
They were married for five years, and after five years, they got a divorce. She moved out with the girls. They had twin daughters. He, was, he didn't know what was going on, and he was confused. Shortly after she broke up with her husband and separated, uh, she was invited. Well, actually, after the divorce was final, she uh, was invited by a friend to go to a Bible study or church service within about three months of doing this. And she kind of, well, you know, maybe I'll give this a try. And she went. And after the, the ladies loved on her for a few weeks, she actually found the Lord. And she was dramatically converted by God. Just about three months after her divorce was finalized. But the ladies in her church group began to get around her and began to say, you know, if you're going to go, you know, move on for the Lord, you need, to, you need to have a quiet time. She didn't even know what that was. And so they explained, you take your Bible and, you know, you meet alone with God and you read a little bit of that and He, he talks to you and you talk to Him. So she started doing that. As she's growing in her understanding, they're telling her, you know, you need to also to keep a little journal and write down what He tells you. And so she's writing down little verses and notes and things that she's getting from her Bible reading. And somewhere along in that process, it wasn't too much longer that she began to sense, you ought to reconcile things with Jeff. You ought to, you ought to, and she dismissed it. But she'd go back to that quiet time, and she was doing it early in the morning at about 5 a.m., and she'd come back to it, and the next day, the, the same voice would be saying, you need to reconcile things with Jeff. And she'd dismiss it again. And, and some of us are just like her, right? God speaks, and... We dismiss it, and so she'd come back again, and the message was, it was just always seemed to go back, you need to reconcile things with Jeff. And that began, out of her own quiet time, began her journey of reconciling. It took a while, a few more years to reconcile. They were married again, and they tell their wonderful story of God's grace and redemption in their book together, I Do Again. And how did she know what to do? God spoke to her in her quiet place with a voice that she couldn't get away from. You know, this is not an anomaly. This Cheryl is not having some kind of a alter universe experience. This is the experience of the children of God who walk with Him. The consistent testimony of Christians down through the ages who are just audacious enough to believe that the, vo the still small voice of God that spoke to Elijah still speaks in our world today. He speaks to me and He speaks to you. And please don't, don't misunderstand me. This is not going to be like going to McDonald's and ordering a number two off the menu with extra pickles. It's, you know, some people want, you know, they just want, you know, they need guidance. God... You know, I need to move forward with you, and so here we go. I'm just going to flip this book open, I'm going to plop my finger down, and whatever it says, I'm going to do. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a place like Moses did, where you're meeting with him day after day, and week after week, and month after month, and when you start doing that for a while, you're going to be able to pick up his voice, even though it's a small whisper over every other voice in the room. And, and, and someone's going to ask you, how do you know it's God talking to you and not someone? And you're good because you've gone out to the tent of meeting, because you've stood in the presence of the Lord. It's going to be absolutely crystal clear that the only place this message could be coming from is from God Himself. And you say, yes, Lord. So don't expect a miracle cure here. Flip over in your Bible one day and it all to make sense, but you can make out His voice over time. How am I going to move forward with God? Moses shows us that one of the most important things for us to do first is to get alone with God. But there is a second thing here, and we want to come to that next. you getting alone with God outside the camp in the tent of meeting was not enough for Moses, and this is very astonishing to me in this text. This man already has a relationship. He already he already has a testimony. He's already meeting with God. But he's having a crisis because he wants something more from God. A crisis of leadership, a crisis of guidance. God is telling him in the, this chapter, move forward, thou and the people, verse number one, 
But I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to send my angel. Look at that again. Verse number two. And I will send an angel before thee, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. Verse three, for thou art a stiff necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. But this made Moses uncomfortable. So he sought God for something more. It's pretty clear to me what he sought. In fact, I want to point out to you what the something more is because it sits right in the text. And Can you get your Bible out? I mean, I'm going to have some verses on the screen, but I want you to see this in your Bible. You might even want to underline the word. I'm not telling you to write in your Bible. I grew up in, you know, Bibles were sacred. You don't write in them, but I, I've since got over it. Now I write in my Bible all the time and I circle important words and I make notes to myself in my Bibles. But would you look back at chapter 33, verse number 12? What, what is the something more? I mean, he's already walking with the Lord. He's already has this tent of meeting. God is talking to him. What more could he need? Verse 12, Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. That's what you're telling me, God. You know my name, and I have found grace in your sight. I get it. All right, verse 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, that I may find grace in thy sight. Look at the next verse, 16. That I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Verse 17. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. What word is the key word that keeps coming up? Grace. God, I know I, 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 I need your grace. But on top of that, he says in verse 13, that I may find grace. I want more grace. Anybody want more grace in this room? God, I've, I, I've experienced a little bit. I know you know me by name. I, you've called me into the fellowship of Christ. I, I am a born-again believer, but I want more grace. And this is exactly what Moses, he's walking with the Lord, but he's not ready to move forward with God until he gets more grace. Number two, get alone with God. Number, that's number one. Number two, getting grace from God. How do I know that I'm moving forward with God and not just on my own? Because I'm getting alone with God regularly, I can hear His voice. Number two, because I'm getting grace from God when I need it. Now what do I mean by grace? Let's talk about this word. Grace means divine power. Now, I know many of you have this definition memorized. It's undeserved favor, and it is. But it's really more than just undeserved favor. It is divine power or enabling that meets me at the point of my need. All right, do you have needs? I do. I have needs every day. Some of them more significant than other needs, but I ask him, and his, and his grace flows in to meet me at my point of need. This is grace. So Moses is saying, I need your grace in my life. And I think there are primary, two primary ways in which he wants to see the grace from God. And the first one is in verse 13. Let's look there together. This is um, chapter 33, verse 13. Now therefore... Now let's go back to verse 12. Let's start with a paragraph. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. Here's the grace I want. Letter A, show me now thy way. You know what he's saying? I don't want the angel. I want you to show me the way. That's the grace I want from you. This is the point. God, I'm not comfortable moving forward with an angel. When it comes down to it, if, if I really have found grace like you say I have, then what I'd like you to do is come down here and leave this nation yourself. You do it. Hey, look, verse 13, this nation is thy people after all, not my people. You lead them. Show me now thy way. Did God hear him? Look at verse 14. Next verse. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Ultimately, rest in the promised land. I'll get you there. I'll get the whole nation there. I will go with you. He prayed, Show me thy way. And God said, I'm with you. I'm, I'm there. You have this grace. I'll go with you. This then is the most distinguishing feature of true Christianity. 
This then is the most distinguishing feature of Christianity. Did you get this? The most distinguishing feature of Christianity is that God goes with Christians and other people don't have Him. And if you're moving forward with God, He is with you on the journey. If you're moving and He's not with you, are you sure you're a Christian? Because the most distinguishing feature of true Christians is that God is with them. Proverbs 16 and verse number 9, I think it's on the screen. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. A true believer has God guiding his steps. And I think God says that, or Moses says that very thing in verse number 16 in his prayer. He says, how is it going to be known? Wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? How are people going to know that we really have received your grace? Look at it. It is not in that... Is it not in that thou goest with us? The distinguishing mark of God's people is that God goes with them. Moses is saying, how else will other people know that we're not heathens and we're really following Jehovah if you don't go with us? That is the distinguishing feature. If you go through life and God is not with you, how can you know for sure that you're a Christian? Because God goes with His people. He, re, he goes on to say, So we'll be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The distinguishing mark of God's people is that God goes with them. So there are only two groups of people in the world, those who do life with God and those who don't. Which group are you in? If you can make your way without inviting God to be part of your day, there might be a question about whether or not you belong to Him. Christian people go with God. They want His grace to direct their steps. They wait for His guidance. If you aren't going with God, if you're just flying by the seat of your pants, there isn't a whole lot separating you from all the rest of the heathen in the world. Well, Moses got what he prayed for, right? Chapter 33, verse 14, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. You know, having obtained his prayer request, having obtained your prayer request, most of us would have said something like, Holy Moses, it's time for a praise meeting. Let's go to church. Let's celebrate. I got a testimony. Testimony, testimony. Here's my hand. Testimony. I got a testimony to give you. Here is my testimony. I pray that God would go with us. And he gave me a sign. He said, I'm going to go with you. Hallelujah. I got my testimony. I got what I asked for. God has blessed me. Heard my prayer. Thank you, God. I'm good. You sit down and everybody sings, To God be the glory. I'm not trying to make a mock of a testimony service. Testimony services are great, but I, what I do want to illustrate for you is that an answer to prayer wasn't enough. What did Moses want? He wanted something more. It wasn't enough for him just to get this favor that God go with him. He still wanted something more and he makes another request. Here's a man who met with God at the tent of meeting, who spoke to God face to face like a friend, who had his prayer answered by God as we just saw, and he still wants something more. What's that? Verse 18. Verse 18, chapter 33, the Bible says, And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Second prayer, prayer request, show me thy glory. This is the grace I want from you. Now, glory means something of weight, of substance, even of value. The, the Old Testament word, that's what it means. You, you can think of gold because it's weighty, it's heavy, it's substantive, and it has value. And so, to say that, to speak of God's glory, he wants to see something of God's immensity, something of His majesty, something of His true substance. Now, listen, this is fascinating to me. Is this teasing your mind a little bit? Here's a guy who's already meeting with God and the pillar of the cloud is standing in front of the tent. He's already seen God split water and drop manna from the sky so the people have something to eat. And he says, no, 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 I want something more. I want to really see you. <sighs> would to God that we would have that kind of a hunger and passion. And, and Jesus said in the New Testament, right in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. 
hungering and thirsting after God. And we see this in Moses. Yes, he meets with God. Yes, he gets an answer to prayer from God. But that's still not enough. Give me more grace. Show me now thy glory. And you know what? God could have said something like, you know, that's really a neat request and a great idea, but not now, buddy. You're just going to have to wait till, you'll die. wait till you die. And then that's what most of us think, right? We're going to see God's glory one day. You know, when they put me in the ground, and that's it, and I move from this life, and I cross the Jordan into God's presence. Yep, I'm going to see the glory. That's not what Moses is at. He isn't asking to die right here. He's asking right now to see the glory, the substance of God. And you know what God says to him? He doesn't say, not now, buddy. Look with me at verse number 19. This is the next verse. Here's God's answer. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Let me break this verse down and show you what God showed Moses. First of all, He showed him his character. He said, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you. This is all of God's goodness and grace and graciousness. He is actually, God is not just doing good for people. You know, we say, what's that saying, right? God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And it isn't just that He's doing good. He's actually good-natured. He's actually favorably disposed to people. And God says, I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you a little bit of my character. He says, I'm also going to show or proclaim the name of the Lord. The name here represents all that God is. His reputation, His fame, or His glory, the fullness of all of His attributes. And He's actually inviting Moses, really take a peek at me, and you're going to see that I'm gracious, verse 19, and merciful. I show grace to those I want to show grace, and I am full of mercy to those on whom I show mercy. So God decides to show grace and mercy, and God went in with it. He was okay with it. He picked Israel and Moses to see His glory. And you know what? Because of the work of Christ, because you've been converted, you too have been invited into, picked by God to see His glory. How precious. Let me set the context again for you. Moses is coming off one of the biggest failures of the people. They've fallen into idolatry. God's ready to wipe them out and start fresh. They'd made a golden calf and danced around it. But Moses stood up for the people, as we've already noted. He gave them a second chance. And he has, and he, now he has seen firsthand that God is gracious and merciful. Here's an important thing about seeing God before I move on. When did... Moses see that God was, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I'll, be, I'll show mercy to him, to those I show mercy. It was after Israel's failure. You know, one of the neatest times that we see God and really appreciate his attributes is when we've failed. When I've lost my temper, when I've had a bitter spirit, when I said something I shouldn't have said, when, I, when I've done something I wish I wouldn't have done, and God meets us, and how does he meet us with a club? Man! Ready to get another whack in on that girl. Woo! It's not God. He meets us with grace and mercy. That's often when we see God for who He really is right after we failed. What a precious thought. That's not all. He showed him his character. God's good. Here's what my name is like. But he also showed him something of his radiance. Look at this. We're almost through verse 21. And following chapter 33, 21, the Bible says, The Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I'll put thee in the cleft, or a hole, or a crevice of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Well, this is a curious thing. Moses asked to see God. And God says, I'll tell you what, I'll let you see my back parts. Oh, that's not a very good image. But you have to remember, right, that God is not, he, He's a spirit, right? He's not physically flesh and blood. He doesn't have body parts like we do. So when we're talking about the back parts of God, we're not talking about some kind of 
uh, inappropriate or ugly parts of a person. We're talking about probably the after effects, kind of like when a comet passes by and there's a tail of its remnants that left behind. If Moses had seen the full-orbed beauty of God's glory, it probably would have squeezed the life right out of him. In fact, the New Testament says in John chapter 1, verse number 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten of the Father who is full, he hath declared him. Only Jesus revealed. So if any of us saw the full-orbed glory of God, it would overwhelm us. So what he saw was something like the, the tail of a comet, the, the after effects of God's presence. I'm going to cover you, and when I get by, I'm just going to show you just a little bit and dazzle you, the back parts of God. Well, this teases us a bit, for it holds out the possibility that we too might see some of the after effects in this life of the glory of God. Could it be that you too might see God? As I just mentioned, we sometimes see Him through our failures when He meets us with grace and mercy and forgives us. Here are some other ways we see Him. We see Him in the pages of Scripture as He reveals Himself. We see Him in the viewpoint that we experience in a sermon when we see God in a way we hadn't seen Him before. And a preacher or a book opens it up to us. And sometimes God touches us and lets us see Him through an unexpected channel. And when we do, we're experiencing some of these after effects of the glory of God. I don't think I've shared this story before. A boy packed a lunch. He gathered up some grapes, put them in a little baggie and put them in a sack, grabbed up a couple of juice boxes and headed down to the park. It was just a few steps from his house. It wasn't far and he was permitted to do this. When he got to the park, he sat down on the end of a park bench. At the other end was an older gentleman. And the boy whipped out his juice box and took a sip and he opened up his sack of grapes and he took a grape and he looked over at the man and smiled. And then after a little bit, he just took his little sack of grapes and he kind of pushed them down the bench toward the older man as if to offer them, without a word, just to kind of offer them to the gentleman. The gentleman looked down at the grapes and reached in and pulled one out, smiled at the boy, popped it in his mouth. And so they shared a moment of grapes together. The boy had more than one juice box with him, and having one in his hand, he thought he'd do the same thing, and he slid down another juice box. And the older man again returned the favor and picked up the juice box and began drinking. And so here's the boy at one end and the older gentleman at the other end, and they're eating grapes. And sipping juice, and they're sharing a moment together, even though all that's being communicated is nonverbals, smiles and eyes. After a little while, the boy knows his time is up and he ought to be going home, and so he packs up his sack and packs up his things, looks over at the old man one more time, and he gives him a nice smile and turns and walks back the few steps to his house. And when he gets home, he still has this wide grin on his face, and his mom asks him, what, what's, what's the deal with the big, wide grin on your face? And the boy says to his mom, I sat and shared my lunch with God today. A while later, the man got home to his house, and his wife asked him why he had such a wide smile on his face. To which the old man replied, I ate lunch with God today, and he's a lot younger than I imagined him to be. <laughs> God is looking for ways to connect with you and to make himself known. The question is, are you looking for him? And are you convinced you can't move forward without him? Shall we pause for prayer?